All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, good evening to those of you joining us from Europe and good morning from those on the West Coast. Uh, so this is panel seven um, of the EIP conference. Uh, this panel is on the topic of disinformation, uh, more specifically how to confront and um, manage disinformation and, and fight it. Um, and so we have three papers lined up, three uh, teams who are gonna be presenting. Um, and uh, so we were supposed to have four, uh, but it, uh, unfortunately uh, one team couldn't make it today. And so we're only gonna have three, which means more time, more flexibility and uh, more uh, active discussions uh, after the presentations. And so uh, we're gonna start off right away. Uh, so this is gonna be like 10 to 15 minutes uh, presentation. And then um, we're gonna have some discussion uh, at the end. So we're gonna start right away with uh, Angus Bridgman and Mathieu Laving from McGill University. So I'm just gonna let you do your thing. We can see that. But I'm unmuted. Oh, I had a dollar for every time that it happened. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me, and, and thank you, Nick, for, for discussing, and Morgan for for um, or Thierry and Morgan for discussing. Really happy to be here and, and share some of this work. That's a it's a paper in progress. That um, you know, I think when we wrote the abstract and submitted it to the panel, we had really high hopes for the results, and the results haven't quite panned out to what we kind of expected. So, actually, really, this is a great opportunity to share this work and get some feedback from folks and try to understand kind of next steps. So this picture that you see on the screen here was taken by my dad in Winnipeg uh, during the trucker, um, uh, the Truckers for Freedom protests in Canada. And I just found it striking. He, he called me and said, hey, there's these trucks in front of the Manitoba ledge. And I said, you've got to take a picture because one day I'm going to use it in a presentation. And so here we are. And this sort of is this intuition that in the Canadian context, there's something going on where um, it's been historically true that American politics and American um, information kind of seeps north into the border and really impacts Canadian culture and Canadian politics. But we've seen sort of a much more visceral reminder of that in recent years. And here we have sort of outside the provincial legislator uh, during protests on a national um, issue, these two flags, flags sort of given equal weight. I think in, in many countries, you would look at this and this would sort of just be a little bit appalling, but in the Canadian context, this is kind of normal and has become to some extent normalized. So there's this intuition that we have that like, there's something going on here. There's some, there's something seeping north of the border. And so, um, uh, this kind of builds on work that we've done around sort of COVID-19 conspiracies that sort of found a really warm home in, in the United States, thanks to some sort of elite level support for them and kind of uh, impacted the national conversation in Canada. Um, but today we're gonna really be talking about American style vote conspiracies uh, in the, 21, uh, the, the recent uh, Canadian federal election last fall. So, um, I'm not going to get too much into the theory. Uh, happy to share the paper with anyone who's interested to sort of look a little bit more broadly at kind of belief in um, electoral body performance and sort of the, the integrity of the vote. But just sort of a, a bit of a backgrounder. Um, in 2020, there was um, massive claims of vote manipulation of vote fraud in the United States, largely supported by Trump. Um, there are still many in the United States that do not believe the vote was a legitimate one um, and that uh, the, the now president Joe Biden is sort of the legitimate president. So there was just this huge amount of misinformation circulating during the election. Um, and there's been some studies of that and really in sort of the misinformation space, there's some really good evidence that people are much more likely to believe in ideologically aligned misinformation. So misinformation that supports their existing worldview or supports their in-group or their political party. So we know that is kind of happening in the States. Uh, we know also that sort of events and narratives in the United States have been shown to influence public opinion in Canada. There's been a lot around COVID-19, including some work that me and, and, and some colleagues have done. Um, we ran this large election study uh, during the last election. We sort of have some circumstantial evidence that election-related misinformation was propagating in sort of social media spaces in Canada, uh, particularly on sort of more niche platforms. Um, uh, so like Rumble and, and Telegram. Um, on Twitch. Uh, so we had some circumstantial evidence. So we wanted to sort of formalize this and understand kind of 
did this breakout, did this have an impact on kind of Canadian attitudes and behaviors and was it present on Canadian social media? So here's sort of our research questions. Uh, were there more claims of election malfeasance in the 2021 Canadian election? And how similar were those claims, those circulating in the United States? And then who, who kind of believed those claims? To test this, to answer these, we used some pretty imperfect data. So some large scale social media data collected from Reddit and Twitter alongside a survey that we ran um, that has some questions that sort of get at this, but maybe don't tackle it perfectly. So happy to talk about that maybe later. So first on the social media side, pretty straightforward hypothesis. There were more discussions of election integrity on social media in 2021 as compared to 2019 in Canada. How do we do it? We looked at sort of four of the most popular politics related hashtags on Twitter, about 4 million tweets from 2019 and 2021 combined. And then also looked at sort of the two biggest Canadian subreddits for politics, our Canada and our Canada politics. And that's about 800,000 comments. So combine those two, and then we use a dictionary based approach. Um, here are some examples of terms that we searched for. So this is trying to find language that's related to election integrity in the, in the two elections. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, here's the results. Um, we were very surprised when we ran it and, and tried a few different permutations, but basically what we find is relatively small percentage of content along that x-axis, that's the percent. So for example, on Reddit, it's 0.1%, so one out of every thousand comments, so a relatively small proportion of comments were picked up by our dictionary. Um, and we see similar levels in 2019 and 2021. And on Twitter, we actually see more in the 2019 election as compared to 2021 election. So this was a bit surprising to us. Um, our dictionary approach didn't detect that. We have a couple um, theories for why that is, most notably that uh, sort of in the post-COVID world, uh, Twitter and Reddit have both sort of stepped up their moderation efforts. They did it so initially around COVID-19, but there's some, um, Twitter has sort of election integrity initiatives and was doing some moderation on like egregious um, uh, misinformation around election integrity. So we thought maybe that might be what's going on here. But regardless, we don't find sort of evidence in our social media data that, that discourse was more present, albeit on sort of the major mainstream social media platforms, insofar as you can call Reddit mainstream. So that's on our social media side. Um, on the survey side, <clears throat> we sort of have two hypotheses. The first is about this ideological alignment. So the extent to which sort of we think right wing Canadians, given that they're influenced by their right wing counterparts in the South, they're more likely to believe that the election was fraudulent, less likely to have confidence in Elections Canada between the two elections. And then we have this third hypothesis looking at sort of misperceptions. So one of the things particularly in the United States that happened was claims around sort of um, the fallibility of mail in ballots. Um, and uh, vote, vote, uh, uh, votes being counted by machines versus counted by hands. These were both narratives that circulated in the United States. So we thought that people who had been kind of exposed and come to believe those would have lower uh, perceptions of election integrity. In terms of the design there, we used two surveys. We used the Canadian election study from 2019 and then a study that we ran um, in 2021, the Canadian election misinformation study. Um, and, uh, you know, um, both have uh, very large sample sizes. The Canadian election study is something like 30,000 and the, um, the one in 2021 is about 7,000 with 3,000 recontacts in the post-election survey. In terms of questions, we look at sort of perceptions of electoral integrity. So did Elections Canada run the election fairly? Were ballots counted accurately? Were the results trusted? We have that first measure, Election Canada ran the election fair fairly for both 2019 and 2021 and the other um, questions in our survey. So we just have them in the 2021 context. And then we have some questions about election misinformation in 2021 as well. And we sort of do some regressions with them um, with a, a range of controls, including sort of uh, like typical ones that you find in the Canadian context. And then we're particularly looking at sort of the role that ideology, satisfaction, news consumption, et cetera, play here. So what do we see in the Canadian context? So on the y-axis there, zero to one is confidence um, that Elections Canada ran the, the election um, fairly. Um, so you can see sort of in both 2019 and 2021, relatively high levels of confidence in Elections Canada. Um, the blue line is in 2019 and the red line is in 2021. And along the x-axis there, we have ideology. So self-declared ideology on a zero to 10 point scale with 10 being your you're very far right and zero being your very far left. A couple things about this. 
uh, the blue line is almost completely horizontal. There's slight differences between those on the left and right in 2019, but very little. So basically relatively high confidence for everyone in 2019. In 2021, we see that, that balance shift. So we see that the left-hand side move up and the right-hand side move down a little bit. What we had actually anticipated was the right-hand side would move down quite a lot. And in fact, that's not what we see here. We see a slight decline amongst right-wing Canadians in, in um, trust in Elections Canada. But what we really see the large effect is that increase for left-wing Canadians, increased confidence. So this is sort of, we, we didn't anticipate this, and this is sort of an interesting potential byproduct where maybe left-wing Canadians observed um, the claims of election malfeasance in the United States and sort of responded with increased trust towards their election administration body. Another thing that might be going on here is that people are happy that their party won. It's not a perfect explanation in this case because the Liberals sort of a center left party won in both 2019 and 2021, but you might sort of expect that um, satisfaction with the, the elections um, mattered, um, although it's controlled for in, in the model here. Um, so there's, there's, you know, we find evidence of ideological polarization, but it's not necessarily exactly what we expected here. Um, and we still do have overall high, high levels of confidence in Elections Canada. Um, we also look at sort of correlates of perceptions uh, of election integrity. So we have sort of these four measures here. Was the election administered fairly? Were votes counted accurately? Do I trust the results? Um, and do I trust mail-in ballots? And there's a range of findings here. I just, again, kind of want to highlight the ideology here. So we do see sort of that very strong effect for ideology. Um, we do also see that people who had those misperceptions, so this is that H3 around whether or not um, how ballots were counted in the Canadian context and whether or not mail-in ballots are as trustworthy or not, sort of being also associated in the correct direction with confidence in the election. Um, so we don't see that increase in volume of discussion of election integrity on mainstream social media platforms. We do see an ideological polarization, but not really exactly what we expected. And we do see that those misperceptions about the ballot process are associated with lower confidence in the 2021 Canadian federal election. So there's some results here. Um, they're generally in the direction expected, but imperfectly. And the social media data really isn't doing us any favors here. And it's sort of calling into question how this the, the mechanism by which that ideological polarization or those misperceptions are act acting. So I think probably the next steps and, and you know, would love comments on anything, of course, including the work to date, but also some, some kind of forward thinking comments where I think this, this sort of these hypotheses and these research, research questions are, are sufficiently important that we need to run a second study that really focuses on like exposure to US information sources, beliefs about the US election results, beliefs about the Canadian election results, and tries to really tease out those, those relationships in a much richer way. Because right now, um, our data is sort of nibbling around the edges and not really getting at the core of what's happening. Um, and we also have to think about sort of a refined social media approach. So again, we, we really did see, uh, you know, I promise you, in the election study, a lot of this misinformation circulating. Um, we had we had a team of researchers the night of the election monitoring different live streams of like Rebel News, Twitch channels, YouTube channels, and just the amount of people who were saying like, oh, these elections are rigged, Trudeau bought the election, blah, blah. There's just, there's an enormous volume and we just didn't detect it. And so we're we're kind of a bit confused about this. And and um, so anyways, that's that's a uh, that's a that's a challenge. It's something we need to we need to figure out how to precise. Uh, we have great volumes of data across a variety of platforms, in, including about 30 Telegram channels where a lot of these things were discussed. The challenge with that is that it's just not, you know, Telegram channels in the Canadian context max out at about 10,000 people. So you're talking about relatively small people, number of people talking to each other and claiming election malfeasance. So it might actually be that this is still on the fringe and it's just because we were looking at that fringe that, that we saw a lot of this. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there, um, but would love any comments, feedback. Um, I think it's a an incredibly important topic. It comes in sort of a line of work we're doing, looking at the extent to which American politics influences Canadian politics, and I think this is really an important dimension. 
the good news for the Canadians and the audience here is that it actually seems that despite this, despite these fringe platforms, confidence in the elections is still relatively high. And I think that's actually the big takeaway is that, yes, there's some ideological polarization, but nothing like what we saw in the States. And in fact, it isn't necessarily even clear that it's going in the wrong direction right now in Canada. So that's sort of a, a positive takeaway, maybe in a, in a panel on disinformation and elections where it's probably generally not going to be good news. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, these are our Twitter handles, but you can reach out to us via email or whatever if you have any comments or questions. And thank, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Angus. Uh, really, really interesting project. Uh, um, and so we're going to move on to uh, actually our second presentation, um, which is the uh, Dmitry Kornosov, sorry, uh, from the University of Helsinki. Uh, so you can share your screen and, and start the presentation, Dimitri. Just a second. Yeah. Talk good. Take your time. <laughs> yeah. Amor, míralo. So I, uh, I hope uh, the uh, the presentation is visible. Yes. Perfect. Uh, so, uh, uh, my presentation is uh, a bit of, uh, so to say, uh, a legal take on uh, the problem of misinformation, specifically uh, uh, misinformation on social media, uh, which was uh, discussed uh, in the uh, first uh, presentation. Uh, how will I uh, uh, cover it uh, more generally, but uh, there will be a specific uh, case in point in, in the middle. So I uh, start off uh, in a legal, <laughs> rather legal fashion by trying to uh, <laughs> come up with the working definition of uh, legal misinformation. It, uh, of course, uh, uh, it, uh, it's uh, just uh, uh, rather fuzzy, uh, just, uh, just trying to uh, just set, set uh, the stage, but that's, uh, uh, I would say a legal uh, approach uh, to things because uh, uh, in uh, legal studies it often starts with trying to define even uh, the most the most basic things, and then it turns out that these definitions are not really that workable. So, uh, in uh, context of my presentation, uh, I'll try to. Uh, use uh, the term uh, misinformation that encompasses both uh, information that is uh, knowingly false and uh, the information which is just uh, misleading. So that kind of the kinds of information which may be partially or, or even uh, wholly correct. However, uh, if placed outside of the uh, context, uh, they may uh, mislead uh, the end user of uh, social media platform. Uh, and uh, then the nexus to election is uh, 
through the fact that this misinformation concerns uh, the organization of elections or uh, can, uh, candidates or parties competing in, in election. Now, of course, as uh, we know from the experience of uh, recent years, uh, misinformation may emanate from different sources. So this uh, may be uh, both uh, internal uh, sources, that is uh, political actors trying uh, to uh, influence uh, the election. And it may be uh, external actors who are seeking a particular outcome or they are seeking to undermine uh, their uh, perceptions of uh, electoral integrity. Uh, so uh, as we see from uh, from the first presentation, but also from the uh, growing uh, body of studies, uh, the electoral information on social media platforms actually has uh, real world uh, harmful effects. So it actually seems to affect uh, uh, the way uh, people perceive uh, electoral integrity. So uh, uh, the uh, and the result may be that people uh, may end up thinking that uh, the situation with electoral integrity is worse than it actually is. So uh, in uh, this way, of course, uh, misinformation is a serious issue. Uh, however, uh, what uh, I'm going to argue is that Currently, uh, although uh, there is a growing perception, uh, growing understanding that misinformation presents a specific challenge, uh, the existing policies, uh, uh, primarily those of uh, social uh, media platforms themselves, are uh, not uh, sufficient uh, because of uh, certain limitations that they have. And uh, in my opinion, the uh, biggest uh, problem here is, uh, so to say, uh, U.S. centrism. Uh, on the one hand, uh, this uh, U.S. centrism is understandable because uh, the United States were and are uh, uh, his, uh, base for most major social media companies, with, of course, uh, notable exceptions of TikTok and uh, perhaps uh, Telegram. It's, uh, uh, kind of more uh, minor but uh, notable uh, players in uh, this league. Uh, However, uh, the majority of companies are American and it affects uh, their uh, behavior and uh, their, so to speak, legal thinking. Because uh, in, in the United States, uh, there is a specific uh, uh, constitutional culture around uh, freedom of speech. Uh, uh, which in the context of the internet has led to a paradoxical result that uh, there is a little in the way of uh, government regulation, but there is a lot of in the, in the way of private uh, regulations of, of speech on the internet. Uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, specific history behind this. However, uh, this is... Uh, this has certain uh, challenges and issues in terms of uh, legitimacy. Because uh, back in 2014, an influential uh, American legal scholar, Jack Balkan, has already noted that uh, the end result may be uh, kind of uh, private censorship. So, uh, the ability of speaker to convey uh, her message may be uh, 
curtailed not by the government but uh, by uh, private companies owning internet infrastructure. And in the specific context of elections, uh, we see these uh, challenges to legitimacy uh, exacerbate specifically in uh, due to a response by the social media platforms to the events surrounding the 2016 and 2020 elections, both of which, of course, uh, saw uh, intense campaigns of misinformation, and in the latter case, the one which resulted in a visible uh, real-world harms and also lasting uh, social media. Uh, however, uh, uh, the uh, responses of uh, the companies, uh, they appear to be largely shaped by the American experience, even though uh, the policies in relation to elections, they uh, claim to be uh, global in effect. Uh, However, they display uh, specific, uh, well, American approaches. For example, uh, there is a lot of emphasis on uh, the events surrounding the election day, which is in many ways typical of uh, American uh, regulations and perhaps uh, public perceptions as well. However, uh, this uh, may not be the optimal approach uh, to uh, targeting misinformation because if uh, we consider misinformation aimed at uh, candidates or parties, uh, it would mostly happen before the election. So in uh, this respect, those policies may not be that effective. Uh, however, uh, uh, a more an even more pressing concern may be that given uh, that uh, this uh, US-centric uh, model of social uh, media uh, involvement in peddling, uh, misinformation, given the fact that it gives uh, essentially, places uh, the owners of uh, preventing misinformation on the companies, uh there is uh, a threat that other governments, uh, including those uh, with authoritarian tendencies, uh, may use this framework as essentially an invitation to strong arm our, uh, social media platforms into complying with uh, their specific uh, political goals. And to illustrate this, I uh, will... Uh, uh, focus on uh, events from last year's Russian uh, legislative election. So, uh, as you probably know, uh, Russian elections uh, have uh, various deficits, primarily in terms of uh, who is uh, allowed uh, to uh, run in uh, those elections. Uh, because of uh, various uh, legal uh, gimmicks, uh, uh, there are the vast majority of uh, opposition politicians and uh, even people generally affiliated with opposition uh, were not allowed to run in uh, last parliamentary election. So in response to that, and uh, generally in response to those exclusionary policies, be be because they were building up uh, during uh, several previous years, basically a position uh, came up with a plan of tactical voting. So because Russia used a mixed member uh, system, uh, those opposition groups affiliated with primarily with Alexei Navalny, uh, they uh, uh, would uh, give uh, endorsements uh, to uh, a particular candidate in uh, each of uh, 
225 uh, single member districts. Uh, and they uh, would do that uh, a few days uh, before the election day to ensure that they would be endorsing a candidate who is actually on the ballot. So um, the uh, Russian authorities uh, naturally saw this as a threat. And uh, early on, about a month before the election, uh, the Russian internet regulator basically became, uh, began a clamping down on all the resources associated with this uh, tactical voting campaign. Uh, so at a certain point, uh, closer to the election, basically the only resources on uh, uh, which uh, the supporters of opposition could rely uh, would be uh, the popular messenger Telegram and the major social media platforms, uh, including the resources run by Google and Apple. So, uh, in this situation, uh, a few days before uh, the election day, the representatives of Google and Apple were summoned to a parliamentary commission, uh, and uh, basically they were told to comply, and which they did soon afterwards. And after that, uh, uh, the Telegram messenger also complied, uh, basically saying that uh, although uh, the company uh, is concerned about uh, human rights and everything, uh, it is not ready to fight uh, at this uh, time. So uh, as uh, the company's founder Pavel Durov explained it, uh, that uh, given that uh, Apple and Google complied, the question was uh, either for him to comply to, or uh, the app would be uh, banned in Russia, uh, which could have been a real threat because uh, the messenger was actually banned in the country for around two years. Uh, so what we see here is that uh, on the one hand, the government he was ultimately successful in strong arming uh, internet companies into uh, compliance. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, one of the companies actually did refer to uh, uh, certain uh, human rights concerns. So uh, to the point uh, saying that although in uh, this case they were forced to comply, uh, there could have been uh, another situation with where they would have chosen uh, to be banned. And this uh, brings us uh, to uh, uh, the concluding uh, part uh, where I uh, discuss uh, what we can learn from that experience and what would actually be uh, legal tools uh, that would allow uh, social and media platforms to counter misinformation, but at the same time to remain uh, within the bounds of uh, international human rights law. Uh, so uh, what uh, I note at the, the outset is that uh, there seems to be a tendency for social uh, media platforms to pay at least uh, lip service to human rights concerns. Because on one hand, we see that uh, statement by uh, founder of Telegram. But on the other hand, we also see uh, the moves by Facebook or, or Meta, uh, the parent company, to set up uh, the oversight board, which uh, explicitly cites uh, certain international human rights uh, documents, but primarily the international comment on civil and political rights in its charter. So uh, in effect, uh, social media platforms appear uh, to, uh, uh, to at least know that uh, inter uh, international uh, human rights obligations do exist. 
uh, and uh, actually, if we look into the con uh, content of those international human rights uh, obligations, for for example, in the way the international covenant on civil and political rights was interpreted by uh, the uh, UN Committee on Human Rights, we see that actually, generally, uh, the policies against misinformation would be in line with those international human rights obligations. Uh, because uh, the interpretation of the UN Committee is that uh, basically uh, vote, uh, voters are entitled uh, to truthful information and they should not be uh, shouldn't be right. So in, in the sense, this is an obligation to counter misinformation. However, uh, with the current US uh, centric uh, framework, uh, there are uh, issues uh, in terms of uh, uh, legitimacy and uh, proportionality. So uh, to uh, fully uh, realize this uh, potential of uh, policies of, uh, of uh, building uh, policies against misinformation that would be in compliance uh, with uh, international human rights obligations, uh, Perhaps a slightly different framework would be needed. Uh, so, in my opinion, this framework could be uh, built by uh, perhaps uh, international expert bodies uh, standing in and uh, proposing some advisory con codes of conduct which could guide uh, social uh, media platforms. So uh, these expert bodies can be uh, professional, academic, and uh, uh, they could all be uh, international uh, legal uh, bodies, such as, for example, uh, uh, the uh, Venice Commission or for the Council of Europe and the OC. Uh, and in this way, there could be a certain perhaps slight uh, shift of power because uh, uh, although in terms of uh, the economic structure of social media market of course a uh, little would change but uh, here actually in terms of uh, standards and uh, uh, a body of uh, experience concerning elections. Uh, here, actually, the uh, European bodies uh, may have something to say, at least uh, in uh, the regional context. Uh, so I believe uh, this is the way to make policies against misinformation uh, both more effective and more uh, accepted by the end users and uh, societies uh, at large.